I shall hand over to Steve and um, you can uh, make your presentation, Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pam. Thank you very much for attending tonight. Uh, yeah, Steve Allard, I've been with Spectro for 20 years now. And in that time, quite a lot of uh, experience with samples, with customers having problems with samples, and uh, mainly being able to try and help them out and let them know where they've gone wrong and, and, and how to improve. So we're going to start off, basically give you an overview of spectrometry, an introduction to some of the common techniques, and then where we're going to use and why we should use a spectrometer, breach the uh, accuracy and precision, uh, quite a good question from a lot of people, and um, then we'll go into sample selection and preparation for solid samples, and the same for molten samples. Have a little look at some of the problems that you can encounter, and I've got a few little pictures of uh, good cases and bad cases of samples and how they've been prepared. So hopefully it's it's going to be of interest, and hopefully it's going to help you in the future and, and make you think about what you're actually doing with your spectrometer if you have one, and maybe even think about it may be time to get one for the future. So spectrometry, where is it? What is it? And how did it come about? So over the years, spectral emission has been used to identify element elements. Uh, most of you will be able to remember right back to your, your childhood and being at school and sticking different salts into the Bunsen burner flame and seeing the change in colour. The change in colour is down to the elements that were in that salt. So moving from that, obviously, if, if one element makes it go blue, another one makes it go green, one makes it go orange, and then there's reds, People thought about it and started to look into that and then work out ways that could actually prove what they were seeing were the elements that they were expecting. And obviously, as that's come along, they moved into a fuse and into photographic plates where they could actually look at the different spectral lines. And then with the addition of photomultipliers and then now computers and newer technologies, We've got the ability to be able to measure the light given off from the elements and actually then give you a, a result that is useful and is going to give you a chemical breakdown of the product that you're looking at. So for metals, we're looking at mainly two techniques that are, are, are the mainstay of what people are using around the country and around the world to actually give them an elemental analysis of their product. So these break down into optical emission spectrometers and X-ray fluorescent spectrometers. And these can be in the form of a handheld system, a mobile system, or it can be a stationary instrument, one where you actually take the sample to and you're working in a laboratory. OES, OES instruments, so optical emission spectrometers, can be arc spark, laser-induced breakdown, inductively coupled plasma, and glow discharge. All these are different ways to actually get optical emission and, and be able to look at the light given off from a sample. With X-rays, typically there are two that are used for metals. There are energy dispersive XRF and wavelength dispersive XRF. Below here, we can actually see the spectrum of light. Um, most of the, the colors that we can see is the visible light. And then we go down into the UV and below UV, we've got X-ray radiation. A lot of the samples that you'll be using and creating will give you light somewhere between sort of 120 nanometers, which is the UV section, going up to 700. Um, and in there, you will, you'll be able to find all, just about every element that you need to be able to look at that will be producing any, any metal. And then below that, the, the X-ray radiation, which does work slightly differently, but again, you'll be able to find all the different elements that are within there. So optical emission spectroscopy. Developed in the late 19th century, spectroscopic technique which examines the wavelengths of photons emitted. Now in the bottom right hand of the, of the screen, you'll be able to see two little um, diagrams of an atom. So basically, if you put a lot of energy into an atom, it creates so much energy in there that the electron jumps out of, out of its position. Obviously, it can't exist as that. So as the electron 
is replaced by one of the free electrons, it has to lose energy to be able to get into that position. So that energy is given off in the form of light. And that light is specific to the element and specific to whereabouts it sits in its, uh, in its orientation. If we can see that light and we can measure it, then we can find out what elements are within a sample. So optical emission can be created by several different energy sources. The common ones are arc spark, ICP, flow discharge, and laser induced breakdown. Arc spark is for a solid sample. These are typically what you will find in a, in a foundry, casting house, in a large steel manufacturer. It's where a solid sample is placed on the surface of the material on the spark stand. A high energy spark jumps across the gap between an electrode and the surface of the material, and it basically creates a plasma of the material there on the, in, in the sample gap. In that plasma, the energy excites the atoms, it actually breaks the elemental bonds, excites the atoms, and then sends out the light. So here we can see there is a UV optic, and there's a fiber optic as well. So a fiber optic can lead down to a different, different uh, measuring system. And then the UV optic in this case is a direct light measurement. So a direct light path of the light that's been seen goes into a measurement system. ICP, a system that a few of you might have heard about, it's for measuring liquid samples. Um, it works with optical emission. What you do is you create a, a gas plasma with argon. So a lot of energy is put, put in through the, the coils around a glass tube. And that allows you to be able to create a gas plasma using the argon. That is a very, very high temperature. And what you do then is you actually squirt the liquid down through the center of the tube and it goes into the flame where it's actually broke down. And once again, you put enough energy into the atoms to be able to create the optical emission. The optical emission then is sent off down and into a spectrometer. Glow discharge, slightly different technique. Again, you're creating an argon uh, plasma. It's created along the surface of a solid metal sample. What happens is, is, is when, the, um, when the atoms are actually eroded from the surface of the material, they're attracted away into the plasma, and then the optical emission is, is produced. With glow discharge, you, you actually eat your way through the sample slowly from, from the start and actually eat way in. So it's got quite a few uses, not just bulk analysis, which is the analysis of your sample. It can also be used for layer measurements and things like that. The LIBS, laser induced breakdown system, spectrometer. These are, they've been around for quite a while now, but they're pretty new for the handheld market. Um, it's something that's really starting to come onto the market now. Uh, you shine a laser basically at the surface of the material. The energy there again creates a plasma on the surface of the material. And that again emits light, which is set down and measured into a spectrometer. So for optical emission, where can we use these? Solid metal samples for arc spark. It can be a mobile, it can be a stationary. Uh, our company itself started many, many years ago, back in 1979 where we uh, the manufacturer, the, the guy who started the company moved from a manufacturer of stationary instruments and went on to make his own mobile one by saying we can bring the mobile, the piece of kit to the sample rather than actually measuring a sample that was brought into a lab. It's normally very fast, somewhere between two and 10 seconds. One of the main things that uh, Mark Spark can do is measure carbon. So people were looking for uh, carbon in a steel sample, and it's a very good technique to be able to do that. Stationary instruments, as we say, a lot of uh, melting shops, uh, casting companies, stockists, these sort of people, they will have a stationary analyzer, and it will be an arc spark one typically, and basically presenting your sample and getting a result from there. It's a lot easier than some of the other techniques. 
and it gives you a result very quick and obviously in the, in the melting industry if you've got molten metal the faster you can get your result the less time it's going to be before you can actually say yes it's good to go or no we need to make an adjustment and that time obviously because you need power to keep it uh, to keep it hot and keep it molten is money so the quicker you can get it the better you can get that result then obviously the, the more money you're going to save from there ICP, some people will do this. Um, it's it's more in the larger companies around. So you you likes of um, Otakumpu, British Steel as it was, uh, Tata now. These types of people, they they may be using them. Um, and it, it, it's a way of measuring a sample, but first you have to digest it and put it into a liquid. So that's going to take some time. Typically, you're going to be looking at around about 15 minutes for a very quick digest. Uh, in some cases, it may be even longer than that. And that's before you can actually put the sample into the instrument and to be able to get, get a result out of it. So typically, you might be looking at nearly half an hour before you could get a sample result. So where time is critical, it's not the technique to be used. So discharge, again, for solid samples. Uh, it can be used for bulk analysis, but it's also used to give depth analysis. The technique actually splutters its way through a sample so you can actually see you can see the coatings as you're working through so if it's something that's been carburized or it's had nitriding done to it you can actually see the nitrogen layer or the carbon layer and you can actually work deeper into the sample so you can see what depth that's come down to you can make sure that your heat treatment's been doing the job correctly it's also good for coating so if you've got some coating on there you'll be able to work your way through it and LIBS, as I say, is quite a quite a new uh, technique. It's quite a small spot on there, and it's a comparative technique to the handheld X-rays and the mobile spark instruments. It's quite fast, and it has got some carbon capabilities. Although at the moment, I think if you're looking for L grades on stainless steels, then you're going to be pushing the technique a little bit, and everything has to be almost perfect to be able to get a good result out of them. But as we say, it's, it's quite a new technique. Uh, technologies are changing very, very quickly. And I don't think it'll be too long before that's going to be one of the techniques to go to. So X-ray fluorescence, slightly different to optical emission, but in a way quite similar. Instead of uh, a high energy, you actually bombard your sample with a, uh, an X-ray. And the X-ray then actually does the same job as what the high energy does on the on the optical emission systems. It actually dislodges one of the electrons, and then as the the, the other electron falls down into its place, rather than giving off a light signal, it actually gives off an X-ray, which is characteristic to the shell in which it's actually dropped from. So that then is sent into a detector, and it's measured over time, and we can actually give you then a result of your sample makeup. Energy dispersive, basically it has one sample detector. So it's a multi-collector and it's looking for the energy levels coming into it. So as each of the different elements give off an X-ray, the sample detects it and it measures it. A little bit like a bean counter in a way. So if you say that each of the elements is a different color, it will go, I've got a red one, I've got a red one, I've got a blue one, I've got a green one, I've got a red one, I've got a blue one. And it basically counts up over time. And then it builds up a graph a little bit like the one on the bottom left. And then you'll be able to break down and look at the different elements within there. And again, once you know how many you've got over a certain amount of time, then you can work out concentrations. With the length dispersive, almost the same, but instead of using a single multi collector, you have an angle of a crystal which then shines or, or bounces the, the x-ray from the crystal onto a single detector. It then moves to a different wavelength for a different element and again and then again and again. So depending on how, how many of these crystals in the system, depends on how long it's going to do to actually measure the sample. But again, you, you basically count over a certain period of time and it will build you a graph up. So typically the graph is now shown down in the, uh, the right hand corner of your screen.
So typically EDF, XRF, so the energy dispersive is what is in our small handheld system and it can be in some benchtop systems. So it can be used for around about two seconds uh, for what we call the, the heavier elements. So from titanium upwards in the periodic table, two seconds on a handheld system is quick enough to give you a very good reasonable result from your sample to be able to see what type of metal it is. If you need to go below there, so down to sodium on a handheld, so taking in aluminium and magnesium, silicon, these sort of light elements, then you have to increase the measurement times to about 10 seconds. So in all, you're looking at a 12 second uh, measurement time. So very good. Um, but they do have some slight issues with them, with overlaps and the amount of computing power and what they have in the system. Uh, it's, it's quite um, computer demanding is, is XRF and handhelds are not a superpower computer. They're not very, very fast. So they tend to be a little bit slower and you tend to compare rather than actually do true, true analysis. Other stationary instruments with EDXRF are um, predominantly used in um, the, the jewellery market and in the precious metals industry. So we can actually do small spot analysis down to 0.1 of a millimeter. So doing checks on things like an earring, you'll be able to do the, the, the small wire stem that goes through the ear. You'll be able to check that and make sure that it is the right material that you're looking at. So a lot of the, uh, the assay officers will have these to be able to do individual links of a gold chain or a silver chain and they're good for being able to do that and they're fairly quick. WD XRF, these are quite big and expensive pieces of kit and they tend to be found in, in the high-end applications or people using uh, high-end nickel applications and copper producers tend to use them. They give you very good uh, stable results, uh, very repeatable but they do have a couple of issues down at very light elements so things like uh, beryllium and boron and uh, lithium they're not very good at being able to work down in that area and also the cost of these are quite prohibitive so we've we now got an idea of what these techniques are what type of instrument they are but where can we use them and why should we use them so goods in Feedstock, if you're looking at your raw materials or you're looking at bar stock, if you're an engineering company, you want to make sure that you've got the right material coming in. So if you check it and you, 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 you find a problem before you've actually done any work on it, you're going to save yourself quite a lot of money. If you don't do any checks while right at the end of the production line when you've actually spent money, maybe melting a sample, machining a sample, producing your, your, final, your final goods, and then find out that you've got a problem, you, you've spent quite a lot of money. So this is a very good area, very big area for the use of handheld XRF, for mobile spark instruments, and for now the, these laser ablation systems. Quick and easy to use. Hopefully it makes sure that you don't uh, make mistakes. I know we put one into the scrapyard, it's, um, Arconic down at Kit Screen, and after we put one in there, then they were doing a check on every piece of material that was going into their melts. They never had a, a lost batch due to bad analysis. So before in the past, they'd every now and again something would, would have gone into the scrap bin that they'd not noticed, they'd, they'd not checked, and uh, it would throw the uh, throw the analysis out. So then they would have five, ten tons of waste material. And then move on to furnace control, which probably most of your casting people are going to be looking at. And in there, we could use OES, uh, WDXRF, or Glow Discharge. The quickest and easiest to use is OES. Uh, glow Discharge, then, very, very similar. And uh, WD, just maybe a little bit slower, but again, with, uh, with the high end nickel alloys, it tends to be the technique that has been used for many, many years. And, it, and is the, the go-to measurement for those alloys, even though now new, new instruments that are made for OES, uh, ArcSpark, can match, if not beat their requirements. 
you measure a sample that's taken from the melt and obviously if it doesn't meet the, the quality that you're looking for or trying to make then adjustments can be made a second or a third sample can be measured and then you you're good to go you can actually pour from a quality control um, some goods are checked in-house before they get to the point where they're actually put out for dispatch or they're put to stock holding um, some of this can be in like the test house so if you've got a part and you've taken it away you're going to do the test make sure it's the right quality make sure it's then got the right mechanical properties and just about all of the techniques can be used there depending on how how good you need to be um, depends on whether or not you're going to use either of the techniques if it's just a quick check to make sure it's the right type of material then a, a handheld xrf or a mobile oes will be good enough for the jobs even even the new lid system in some cases you're looking a little bit deeper uh, it might be that you you've gone through the process of heat treatment so you might use a glow discharge to make sure that the the heat treatment process has given you the right finish on the end of the material so that you've got the right carburizing or right nitriding on, on the the outer surface of the material and then the final one is goods out it's a final check to make sure that what you're actually supplying to your customer is what they've asked for and it's it's carried it gives them the the, the ability to to say yes this is the right material um, it has been known many many industries and, and and throughout time that people put things on racks and they get mixed up uh, sometimes they get stamped wrong and they've been put onto the shelf as being one material and you're sending them out for that material and they're not actually that one so a final check with probably one of the um the handhelds or a mobile instrument is is going to give you that quality check and make sure that you are sending the right quality out so that it doesn't go to the customer you're not then looking at a very expensive recall i remember back in the day when i was at the steelworks sending guys out to australia because uh, a product had actually been made into into um, drive shafts for Toyotas and for Jaguars and these guys had to actually go out and do checks on cars out in Australia and around the world and that was a great expense to the company so a simple check before it goes out of the door it might be insurance that you've not uh, you've not mixed them and got it and it could be quite expensive piece of kit that does the test but it's a quite expensive mistake if you actually make one So once we've got these instruments and they're working, we then got to think about um, the use. Uh, how good are they? And, and what you're actually going to be looking for out of that result. And the main things for these are going to be accuracy and precision. And then as a second or a third option to be thought about is the speed of the analysis. So accuracy is defined as the correspondence or agreement to a measured value. So if you you melt a sample and you're saying, let's say you're making a stainless steel, you want to make sure that that conforms to the right grade. And you want to check and make sure that your instrument is actually giving you the right results for that. Very important, especially if you're giving the wrong readings, then you could be sending something out that's uh, got the wrong analysis and therefore the wrong grade of material. Precision is defined as the repeatability and re of repeat measurements, especially it's the dispersed, dispersion and repeat measurements about an average. So if you spark a sample five times, you expect the result to be very, very similar. It would be nice if it was exact, but unfortunately exact never exists in the world. And then repeatability is the deviation of measurements determined under various conditions. So can we do it today? Can we do it tomorrow? Can we do it in three months time? Is the instrument going to be capable of giving me that same result each time I use it? And then obviously speed is critical in most areas, especially where molten metal is in play. Time is money for people who are having to keep metal uh, in, a, in a liquid state. Parameters here that can change with the operator another day, different sample taking, so a different person taking the sample, maybe you've uh, you've changed the mold maybe uh, you know you've, you've it's it's completely different from one day to the next and then a new sample prep 
So have you just recently changed the, the grinding medium or the tool that's cutting the standard? And then standardization and the number of repeat tests. So looking at accuracy and precision, in real terms, what does it actually mean? So if we look at the target, and here we can see that there's been several marks made around the target. None of them have actually hit. And none of them are actually very close to each other. So this one is, it's not accurate and it's not precise. So in B, we've got a target that's got shots all the way around it. And the accuracy, if you take the average of all the measurements, so there's actually 11 shots on there, if you take the average, then you're going to be getting a result that lies in the middle. So that's good, but it's not very precise, so it's not repeatable. So it means you've got to do a lot more measurements to be able to get a true and accurate result from your sample. In C, we have a, a precise, so all the shots are very, very close together, but unfortunately they're off target. So yes, it's good that you've got a result. It's good that they're all very, very similar, but it's actually measuring away. Now that could be the sample is wrong. You need to make an adjustment, but in worst case scenario is actually it's your analyzer that is wrong. So therefore it would have to be adjusted to bring that in line. And finally, what everybody's after, what we're all, we're all striving for is an accurate and a precise result. Everything's on target and everything's close together. Because you, you build up an average, you build up a, an understanding of your instrument, it means that you don't have to do as many measurements or as many shots at the target to be able to do that. You can actually cut down on the number of times. So again, because you've got a precise and accurate result, you can cut down the amount of time that you're actually doing, doing the measurements for. Right, so we've got these very good new instruments or maybe even an old instrument. But one of the things that makes a big difference is the sample. The sample is a key ingredient to obtaining a result. It must be homogenous. It must be representative of the batch. It must be cooled if it's a molten sample at the correct rate. And it must be prepared correctly. Any of these will cause you problems. If your sample is not homogenous, then obviously your repeatability is going to be out. You, you're not going to be able to get the same result every time you spar or every time you test. So making sure that your sample is, is a good mix. Um, in a lot of cases, I've seen additions put into furnaces and the sample's been taken too quickly. So it's not had a chance to actually mix before the sample's been taken. Uh, it must be representative of the batch, obviously, depending on whether or not it is a molten sample or whether it's a batch of incoming stock. Are you going to do one or two, or are you going to do all of them? And then cooling rates. So a sample needs to be killed fairly quickly to make sure that uh, all the sample, all the elements remain within that sample. Uh, they don't come out of the uh, solution and go into green boundaries. A uh, typical example of that is, uh, is carbon in, in high carbon cast ions, uh, SG ions, these sort of things that as a, a sample cools slowly, the carbon goes off and goes into the grain boundary. And that will give you problems for measurements because it, it's sitting there as little like little globules of, uh, of carbon that you actually measure. So it, it fires little explosions off during the time. So you don't get an homogenous result. You get a, you get a, a variance in there. So solid metal samples, we're looking here at um, incoming materials. So it might be scrap, it might be um, additions. So how many do you check? Do you check every sample? Um, if, if they're small pearls or if they're nuggets, then that might not be a, an easy thing to do. And it's certainly time consuming. So maybe you do one in a full bag, maybe you do 10 out of a, a ton bag. It's, it's how you get the better picture of, of what's happening within your raw materials. Um, if they're large chunks that you're melting down, so if they're like al aluminium that you, you're, you're melting down large pieces to, to produce what you're wanting to produce, checking each of them might be an easy way of doing it and you're making sure then that you're, you're putting the right feedstock into your, 
into your uh, furnace. Incoming goods, obviously raw materials, but it's outgoing again. This can depend upon um, the customer. They may they may ask for checks on 100%. So if it's uh, let's say it's a sub C company and they're they're buying valves from you, they might want every valve to be checked. So it's 100%. Some may say, do me one in every 10, and I'll be happy then that you, you, you work them properly and the 10 will do out of a batch of 100, say. Uh, so it, 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 that will often come as a requirement from your customer. But again, it, it gives you that confidence that the materials that you are supplying it, are the right ones. Sample preparation goods in, obviously. We can use ArcSpark, so the mobile ones, we can use LIBS, and we can use XRF. Sample prep on these may be of an interest. Um, if you're a machining company and you're looking at bars and you actually test the outside of a bar, it might be that you get all the contamination from there, and the results you get from not preparing the sample correctly might be high. So let's say the outside carbon rate Ray layer gives you a high result. You then think, have I bought the right material? You send it back. It turns out that you've not prepared the sample good enough. You've not actually cut deep enough into there. So perhaps you'd look at doing it on the end of the bar. Have they got coatings on them? Have they got oils on them? They all need to be clean. Uh, any of these uh, techniques are all surface techniques. So they're actually measuring the surface of the material, even though they're actually in some cases, creating a plasma on there, like the, the arc spark and the libs, it's actually burning part of the material up. Anything that's on that will actually be taken on the surface, will be taken into that plasma, so you will be measuring it. So if there's oils on there, you will pick up the elements that are in the oil. If there's a coating on it, then you'll pick that up. If there's uh, like a paint or something like that, then obviously if you've not seen it, you've not cleaned it off. They all contain elements, which will then give you a strange result. XRF is, even though it's a very, very good technique and, and a lot of people will tell you you can use it on anything and straight away, so through a hessian bag or through a plastic bag, these sort of things, anything that gets in front of it will cause you a problem. So if there's dirt on there, if there's scale on your sample, if there's anything in that that is not of the material that you're wanting to measure, then you're going to pick it up and you're going to measure it. Again, goods out, I think we really covered this, but basically if, if your sample requires testing, then you need to be able to test on a point that is clean. The surface may need to be ground. Uh, arc spark and libs will need the surface to be cleaned, especially on a casting surface, because sometimes you'll get contamination from the, uh, the, the outer or the coatings that were around the casting in the, in the mold. And that may give you strange readings and, and, and make a difference to what you're actually measuring. Uh, ArcSpark will leave a burn spot on the sample, so you have to be very careful while you do the prep. Uh, sometimes on a on a casting, you might be able to do it on a flange where it's been uh, it's already been prepped, so the, the flange has been uh, it's been machined. But sometimes that is a is a, a machine surface that is a mated for a seal, so then you can't put anything on there that's going to burn you a spot. So there are advantages and disadvantages being able to do that. Libs will leave a very small spot on the surface, which is not normally visible, but if you've got a highly polished sample, it may show. So if you've got something that's, uh, that's a prize sample that you're sending out, maybe it's a, a bar pump or something like that for beer, uh, maybe it's um, a body implant. And you're, and you're looking at the, the actual ball of a, of a hip or something like that, you wouldn't want to be testing on there with something that's actually going to leave a small mark because it would be noticeable. It could cause problems in the future. And XRF, uh, you need a clean sample again, free from coatings, but it doesn't leave a mark. So it's very good for samples where you can actually do quick testing. So examples of these, I've already said one of them is, is making sure that the final one is, is for inserts on people's bodies. So if you're having a, a surgical implant, you want to make sure it's right. It needs to be tested before it actually goes out to the hospitals, before it's actually placed in somebody's body. Another example that we have is a very good customer is Rolls-Royce. 
every casting of turbine blades are checked against the original master melt. It's nice to know that they're checking every one and they don't get them mixed up because you wouldn't like any problems with it when you're flying. So quality control is the same again, all the same things you've got to, you've got to prep the sample. You've got to uh, you've got to make sure that it's clean and it's free from coatings. Um, the only exception to that one is glow discharge. So glow discharge, if you're looking for depth profiling, then obviously you don't do any prep, any prep on the surface because that is what you're wanting to measure. You're wanting to measure what those layers are as you're working through to get to the base material. So doing any sort of prep on those is, is going to kill what you're looking for in any case. So molten metal um, sample taking, there are several options here. Um, this can go from a simple spoon for things like tin and lead products to various molds of different shapes or so mushrooms and cones and lollipops, which are commonly used within the, within the industry. And they can be used directly in the melt, poured via ladle or by a vacuum lens. So you're taking a sample away from the, the furnace and cooling it down and making it into a sample that you can then measure. Uh, you've got to make sure that the, cold is, the mould is cooled down before you take the next sample as you're not going to get the same, especially when you need to cool it down quickly, you're not going to get the same cooling effects if you're already putting a sample, a sample mould in there that's already hot. Cast iron, I've already mentioned about the carbon going out into, uh, into the grain boundaries. If you're working with cast iron, you need to make sure that you've got a wide sample. The sample needs to be cooled very quickly uh, to produce a wide sample, and that makes sure that you've got no segregation of the, of the carbon, the, the carbon actually stops within the crystal structure rather than coming out and going into the grain boundary. So it means that you're going to be able to measure carbon using this technique rather than uh, it giving you a, a, a strange reading. So sample prep, it's quite interesting sample prep with, uh, with molten metals. With softer metals, you tend to use a machine, so something like a lathe or a, a milling machine. So this is going to give you a nice flat sample and it's going to give you a nice groove on there. Uh, tin and lead, can be done for most of the alloys without any sample prep. But again, if it does need to be prepped, you'll be using a lathe or a milling machine. And hard cast products, typically machine ground. You, uh, you grind the sample with a grinding wheel or a grinding cup. Typically because these are so hard that if you use a belt grinder, you're going you're gonna to wear the belt around in one or two samples. So it means you're going to be changing it, your, your belt all the time. Steel samples, nickel and cobalt alloys, they can be used using a grinder or a belt finisher. But now, now that instrumentation has moved on and the electronics for the spark has got better, we're finding that, uh, again, the machining of the sample with either a lathe or using a milling machine is better for giving you results that are much better for especially for the gases for low carbon phosphor sulfur so rather than using the literature or the grinding belt so the reason for this is when you're actually sparking a sample the sample is a little bit like lightning it will find the highest part first so if you look at the two samples there we've got one on the left hand side which has been done on a milling machine and the one on the right hand side has been done on a grinder and if you drag a stylus across there and have a look at the roughness of the surface, you can see on the, on the milled surface that it's a very uniform spark, a very uniform peak. So when the spark gets on there, it's going to hit one peak and it's going to stop in the same sort of area and it'll slowly move itself out. It'll not be jumping around. Whereas if you look on the, on the other side, you can see some high peaks, so it's going to move there and they will melt fairly quickly. And once they've gone into to plasma, it then moves to the next. So you find that the, the, the actual spark itself will, will bounce around on the surface. So it's jumping around. So it takes a while to establish a good plasma and a stable plasma, which is then needed for actually doing a measurement. It also means that the spark stand is not as, uh, as, 
as sealed as what you get with a nice flat sample that you would get from a mowing machine. Okay, so what are some of the problems? Several problems that's going to happen during actually taking the sample or actually preparing the sample and it will result in poor repeatability and that gives you poor results. Poor samples with holes in, cracks in will stop the spark establishing or lead to erratic results. A large crack actually eats the spark. So if you've got cracks in your sample, the energy that's in, in a spark system is actually drawn into that and it actually pulls the energy out of the spark. So in some cases it actually stops the system being able to measure. In other cases it just gives you a poor, very very poor plasma in it and you've got very poor results from there. And obviously a hole will do the same. You might not be able to see it when you've prepped it, but if there's a hole in it just underneath the surface, as soon as you start to melt with the uh, creating the plasma, then it's going to burn through that and you're going to run into a hole. The sample's not cool quickly enough, you may get segregation. When you come to actually prep the sample, if you overheat it, it like hardens the surface and then it can cause you problems and, and it, it prevents the spark from actually establishing correct. So your plasma doesn't set up properly to start off with, so then it's going to give you poor results. You use the wrong type of grinding material. So people will use grinding belts, especially for mobile applications where they're going to be cleaning the end of a bar, they're going to be cleaning a casting. So just making a nice clean spot that they can work on. If you use aluminium powder on there and you're looking for aluminium, you'll get pickup from the powder that's actually in the belt itself. So it gives you a it'll give you a spurious reading. I recently uh, re-educated myself with this one looking at titanium uh, for a customer who was sparking pure titanium samples so it should have been uh, CP commercially pure and aluminium should have been less than 0 0.03 uh, sorry 0 0.3 and the results were coming out around about 0.5. Uh, measured it on a norm sample, the norm sample came back okay, measured a couple more samples exactly the same I then decided to measure two or three times on the same spot. We could see the sample actually, the result was actually coming down as we were measuring it more times. The penny then dropped. I asked what papers they were using or what, uh, what substance they're grinding this was actually made from, and it was an aluminium oxide. So we changed the paper to a zirconium one, and oh, as if by magic, the, the aluminium disappeared and we got CP. So it was just simply pick up from grinding it with the wrong type of material. So it's, it's things that you have to keep in mind while you're doing these sort of things to make sure that you don't make the mistakes of uh, using the wrong medium when you're grinding. Keep the grind marks in the same direction. Uh, as we said, the, the sample requires this, uh, this nice surface to be able to bite into, to be able to start the plasma and, and, and create this uh, nice stable uh, emission of light that's coming out of there. So by crossing them over you tend to get uh, different peaks again and different heights. Putting tools that are not sharp may drag the surface, so as you're cutting rather than the actual a nice clean cut, it's a little bit like spreading butter across the surface. So if you've got globules of uh, a typical example of this would be uh, copper or leaded copper, and as you cut with a poor tool it actually spreads the lead across the surface of the material. So when you first start to burn, you're going to get high concentrations of lead because that's actually come and being spread across the top and it's actually hiding the true composition of the material. One thing I'd say is never make a shortcut. Make sure that you take the best sample. Uh, it's, it is important to how you get your results. Always measure more than once. Uh, COVID has taught us one thing, it's a false positive is not a good result. If you measure a sample once and it gives you the right results, people are tempted to actually walk away and say, yes, that's it, that's it. Uh, I've hit my spec and away I go. A second measurement on a different spot might actually give you a different result. So the false positive in the first place, it's actually giving you the right result, but it's on the wrong, it's actually wrong for that sample. So further measurements, I'd say at least two. Uh, statistically, you will say measure seven times, uh, which takes too long, so nobody ever does it. But if you get two results that are almost identical, I think you can be you can be fairly sure that the result is going to be good. Uh, if, if the two are different, then obviously you move on, you do a third spark to see what they're like. 
Uh, but, but I would always recommend people never ever to do just the one spark because one spark, like I say, false positive. And where you go, I think you've made the wrong material and you just poured it and you, you, you then find out further down the line when you come to final checks before it goes out of the door, it's the wrong material. So there's a couple of, well, there's actually seven examples of, of machine finished samples and ground samples. The first one is a ground sample. You can see it's nice and it's rough, it's not polished. Uh, the sample goes all in the same direction. And that one's going to be good for giving you good results. Number two is the same sample, but done on a, on a milling machine. So we can see the grooves are actually curved because of how the, the, the tool spins, it goes along the surface of the material. Very flat, but once again, you've got nice grooves on there that are repeatable along the surface. Number three, as I've just told you, is, is showing you a sample there that's been gone in many different directions. So you can see this crisscross effect on there. And that's going to lead to poor results. Uh, overheating of the sample, so if you cut too deep, examples of this are six and four. You can actually see where the sample has been cut into the sample so much, it's created a, an extra amount of heat in there and the sample's actually gone blue. So that's going to give you poor results. Uh, and certainly on this one being a, a very uneven surface, you're not going to get a you're not going to get a nice flat and good result response from there. Number five is, is a copper sample there that's been sort of left on the side for quite a long time. As you can see, the burn spots are not very good. That's because it's not been prepped. So you're not going to get the right results out of a sample if you don't get the right burn spots. You don't get the right creation of the plasma and a stable plasma that's been, uh, been measured. And then the final one, number seven, is it's quite a good example of, of burn spots and examples there of good ones and bad ones. Uh, black ones, the three at the back there, are examples of a very good burn spot. The black, people will tell you, is carbon, but it's not carbon, it's actual condensate. So as the plasma is being created and then it cools down, the material it's taken up from the surface has actually dropped. And in most cases, that will drop down as a black sooty residue, but it's actually the material that you've measured and not just carbon. A good example of that is uh, sparking a pure copper or a pure aluminium sample because it doesn't oxidize, it doesn't go dark when it drops back down, it drops back down as a copper color and it drops back down as an aluminium color. So you would, you would see more of uh, this here where you get just a nice burn spot without the dark ring around it. The white ones are not sample prep related not greatly you can get it through samples that are not not rough enough to create the plasma that's normally a typical example of where the gas is wrong on a spark system so we use gut hog and gas there to uh, to shroud the sample and the spark and if that gas is contaminated you don't get a burn spot and you get what we tend to call a milk spot so you get this nice white mark on there but you can see it's not actually eaten into the surface of the material and it's eating into the surface of the material, it's actually pulling that up into the plasma that we actually measure. And then the, the brown one is being finished off with an arc. Uh, so you can actually, it's a slightly different technique to spark, but it gives you a different burn spot at the end. So in conclusion, there's many, many uses for spectrometry in the complete cycle of metal product production from goods in, raw materials, melt analysis, quality control, and goods out. These instruments play a key role in any business. It keeps your costs down. It makes sure that you're sending the right materials out at the end of the day. Modern instruments are getting much better. They're getting improved. And new techniques are coming along, uh, especially like the things like the LIBS, where we're getting better and better all the time. But at the end of the day, the basics are still the same. Poor sample will give you poor results and a very basic instrument. They'll give you poor results on a very expensive and the very best instrument. So I thank you all for your time. If there's any questions, please, uh, please speak up. Well, thank you very much, um, Steve. Um, 
uh, very interesting and, and very detailed. So, so thank you very much uh, for that. Um, I don't know whether we've got any um, questions in the um, in the chat, Richard. I can't see any, but I, there might have been some that have come through to you separately. No, I've got no questions in in the chat. I've I've got a question about the XRF guns, um, for Steve. Um, yeah. Can you confirm that because they're using X-ray technology, that anybody that's using those should still really have an RPS on site and and actually be making use of RPA services as well? Yes, it's it's mandatory. Um, you have to inform HSE that you're going to use them. Uh, it used to be 28 days, but they've changed that now. That's now a, an online registration where you actually tell them you're going to be using an instrument uh, that's generating x-rays. And then you must at least consult a radiation advisor. And from that, it's possibly that he'll advise that you take a one of one of your employees is then uh, made up to a radiation supervisor but you will go through we'll work through uh, risk assessments and method statements with you to make sure that the way you're using it is safe um they were all quite powerful pieces of kit even they are even though they are actually small and handheld um you depending on the sample that you put in there you might need to have something underneath it uh, you've always got to think that way. Uh, if it's aluminium, you can get x-rays going through it at two, three millimetres thick. So if you were doing an aluminium sheet and you've got your hand, you've got it in your hand, for instance, which you should never do, but you're going to be able to get x-rays going straight through that. So you do have to think about what you're doing. If it's a small sample, if it's a powder sample, then how are you going to present it to there? How are you going to make sure that the x-rays are not coming out? You might have to have areas where you uh, you fence off an area while you're doing testing just so that none of this the, the stray radiation gets anywhere close to anybody working there but yes they are covered under the ionizing radiation regs of 2017 now as they are okay thank you very much we've got uh, we've got a few questions come through now the, the first one is water residue cause a problem with the results Yes, for a spark system, definitely cause your results. Um, it basically it, it evaporates very, very quickly when the when the spark is created. So it, it will it will kill the spark. Um, it will certainly give you the white burn spot, but it it, it stops the uh, the emission of light really. So it, it's really bad. I know uh, in the past I've had water in a spark stand, and even though you dry it out and clean it, so around about a good two weeks to actually get the system back to being able to measure samples down at the low trace level elements that you needed to be able to do for measuring so it's uh, it's definitely something you must drive the sample if you're using a spark system definitely xrf not as bad but uh, obviously you don't you don't want to be you can, you could use them as, i suppose in water but uh, you wouldn't do it's 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 not good practice Okay, thank you for that one. And the next question is, um, someone says they had an issue when taking a test coin from an SG ladle with what they assume to be slag or dross contamination in the coin. So what's the best way to take a clean coin from the ladle to ensure they've got a nice clean sample? Probably the best and easiest one is, uh, is an immersion probe. So something that you're actually getting underneath the slag before you're taking the sample. So these lollipop produce, um, you know, there's several several companies around who produce these the lamps that you actually put in, and it goes underneath it. But yes, if you take uh, if you take from the surface and there's slag in there and there's impurities and that gets into your sample, that is going to give you bad results. So you've got to try and make sure you. Well, I've seen people try and wipe it away and get, get to a clean spot, but yes, any anything that gets into the sample is going to cause you problems. That's great. Uh, another one's come through. Says not so much of a technical question. But could, would it be possible to display one or two of the slides at the National Foundry Training Centre because they feel that would be a great aid to the apprentices who are there? Yep, obviously we can, uh, I can do that. I can look for some more and uh, anything for that one. Brilliant, thank you very much for that. Um, has anybody got any other questions at the present moment in time? If you, there's only a smaller number on online, so if you want to unmute yourself and and ask the question in person, then please feel free to do so.
I think they're all heavily digesting what uh, what you said. We've got a few comments coming in into the chat box now saying thanks, Steve. Great presentation. Um, very thorough. Um, thoroughly enjoyed it. So uh, it's uh, it's certainly been very well received uh, from that point of view. So thank you. If I could just ask everybody to turn their mics on and thank Steve in the usual way. The ICME uh, do that with our speakers with a round of applause. That would be greatly appreciated. And thank you very much, Steve. I'll stop the recording now and then I'll hand over to Pam for any final comments.